Thanks be to God indeed. Have you ever stopped to, to look at the, at the face of a happy child? There's nothing like that, I tell you. The face of a happy child. Nothing says happiness as much as that smile, right, on a child's face. Especially compared to sometimes when they're not smiling, right? But in their innocence, children can, can overlook so many of the tragedies of life. And they can find happiness really in themselves. Happiness shines through kids. But as we grow older, we, we all maintain this lingering desire to, to shine like that, to shine like we once did. We, we often try to recapture those Right? Those shining moments of our childhood. Now, our Old Testament reading this morning, it tells us that when Moses got back from Sinai with the tablets of the law, his, his face shone like that. There was a brightness about him. In fact, the text says that Moses' light was so bright that he had to put this veil over his face because without it... He was frightening people. See, it's only the reaction of people to him that he became aware that that particular shine was on him. It's only by other people telling him that, by, by witnessing back to him that he's aware of this shine, this brightness on his face, right? Now, this brightness, it, it, it came not from his desire to, uh, to, to polish up his reputation or from his efforts to, to look good in the eyes of the community. It didn't come from that. His shine was a gift of God, and it, it came to him as he devoted himself to doing God's will and God's work. And Moses was on the mountain receiving God's law, and he was busy completing the task to which God had called him, right? He was giving himself to the will of God and his, his shine was sort of this byproduct of his commitment and, and his focus. And like that, that innocent child, he was unaware of that, that brightness, the brightness of his life as, as he lived it in God's light. In fact, the, his brightness was not his at all. But it was this reflected light of God. And I want you to think about that. You know, when you see that, that, that smile on a child's face, or for that matter, when you see a smile on someone else's face, wouldn't it be good for us to see that as the reflected light of God? How would we treat one another differently? if we thought about it that way. See, too often we, we try to be about the light rather than about the work. And we would like to shine in our communities and in our better moments we aspire to make Christ shine through us, right? We've heard that. In any case, our attention and our, our focus are on the byproduct rather than the underlying cause. We, we call attention to Christ best when we do Christ's work in the world. In fact, we can cry out that Christ is the light of the world until we're hoarse, until we're tired, friends. But few, few will ever see that brightness. Isn't that true? We can say with our words that light is the Christ of the world, that Christ is the light of the world. But what does that really mean? Friends, instead of proclaiming it so loudly time and time again, God calls us to keep our focus on doing Christ's work. As we visit the sick, as we feed the hungry, as we clothe the naked, as we love both our neighbors and our enemies, as we forgive over and over again, we immerse ourselves in the ministry of Christ. And friends, by doing that, we reflect his light to the world. Our faces are brightest when we forgive rather than seek revenge, when we give ourselves wholly to serving others. When we do this, friends, the light of God shines through us even when 
we're gone. There's this lingering shine of light. That's how it was for Moses. Long after his death, long after his death, others would encounter the light and be transformed by it. How do we know that? Because as Jesus was about to set out for Jerusalem, he took Peter, he took John, and James, these, these wonderful disciples, he took them up to the top of the mountain to pray with him. And you might imagine, I mean, you know, this, this was, they were, they were the chosen ones, these, these three, right? He decided they were going to be the ones who were going to have this experience with him up on the mountain. They had worked all day, the disciples were tired, and as they sat down to rest, Jesus went on up the mountain just a little bit further, right? And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, just like Moses. His appearance of his face changed, his clothes became dazzling white, and suddenly two men were there, Moses and Elijah, They appeared and they began to talk with Jesus and they were speaking of how he was about to fulfill God's plan by dying in Jerusalem. And as Moses and Elijah were about to leave, Peter, you got to love this guy, Peter, he felt called to say a few words, right? Peter was always that way. This is the very guy who after Jesus' death decided that in the midst of a hurricane of wind, he'd go out of the house and say a few words to people out there. And in his few words, by the way, Peter's the best preacher ever, right? In a few words, 3,000 people come to Christ, right? On that day of Pentecost. But this is the naive Peter before. He's thinking to himself, it doesn't get any better than this. Look, we got Jesus, we got Moses and Elijah all right here on the mountaintop. Does it get any better than that? And so Peter wants to hold on to that. He wants to hold on to that forever. And so right there on the mountaintop while Peter is speaking, he says, let's do this. Let's make some shrines up here. And we're going to make three shrines, and one's going to be for Moses, and we're going to have Moses right here always with us on the mountain. We're going to make one for Elijah, and that's going to be great. Make one for you too, Jesus. And whenever we need all, you know, when, when, whenever we, we want to be in your presence, you're always going to be there, right? And we're going to be able to come up the mountain, and we're going to be able to worship you. We're going to see all three of you and worship you. Now, friends... As I said, Peter sometimes can be a little naive, right? Because the events that preceded Jesus going up to the mountain, Jesus gave his farewell speech. He says, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to kill me. Yet Peter doesn't understand that. And so here he is on top of the mountain saying, let's just build some shelters, and you're going to stay there forever. It's going to be great. But God has very different ideas. A cloud comes and it envelops that. And an unseen voice from within the cloud says, This is my son, my chosen. Just listen to him. And things are going to be all right. Just listen to him. Right? Have you ever had that experience? That kind of experience where you wish you could just hold on to that moment forever. You ever said to yourself, it just doesn't get any better than this, right? It just doesn't get any better than this. That's what this moment was for Peter. Often we, we have experiences that give us such joy, overwhelming joy, that, that, that we don't want to let go of that, right? Is it any wonder that he, he wanted to do something, right, Peter? That he, he wanted to do something to preserve that moment? Don't we all want to do that? We just want to hold on to those moments. You know, in my, in my life, I've had those kind of mountaintop experiences like that. A moment that somehow I knew, I knew 
that God was present, that having had the experience, that my life would be changed. And there was no going back. You know, a few months ago, I, I received an email from the Alumni Association at Rolla. And they were looking for stories related to the best or the worst summer job that alumni had when they attended school there. It's a simple email, and I couldn't think of a particular story, and then I started to think about it. It got me thinking, I, I don't know, maybe it's because this, this year has been a, a year of transition for me and, and, and our family, but, but God took the time to remind me of one of those special times in my life. Between my sophomore and my junior year, I, I took a job with an offshore catering company as, as a galley hand, helping to pre prepare meals for the roughnecks and the engineers, the ones who actually did all the work on an offshore oil rig, way out in the Gulf of Mexico. I remember that job not only because of the experiences that I, I had and the nature of the work, but because I left behind that summer a girl, right? And I got to thinking about that. I'd gotten to know her as we, we spent a semester together in in the wonderful classes of French and biology, right? <laughs> right? And now that the semester was over, I found myself 700 miles from the one that it seemed I, I was just getting to know, right? And spending a couple of weeks on an oil platform, that can make one think a little bit. And I did something that some of our young people have no idea how to do. I wrote letters. Right? I wrote letters. Now, I couldn't send them except all at once, right? But I wrote letters. And as the summer drug along and her birthday approached, I, I knew that I, I wanted to do something special for her, right? So I got in the car and I headed out on what was supposed to be a 12-hour drive. Now, my kids will tell you that they have a name for me. It's called Long Way Lauren, right? Now, you think I would know how to get, right, from New Orleans up to Rolla, over to Steelville, but it didn't work out that way. I missed a turn. I missed a turn. I, I couldn't believe it, and that 12-hour drive became a 14-hour drive, and I ended up in Springfield, right? For some of you who know this geography down here, it's a long way away. And when I finally made it to the house, later than I was expected, right? She was standing there. She was waiting. She was concerned, right? And then she was elated. And she did something that I'll never forget. She smiled. She smiled. And with the long embrace that followed, I knew, I knew that God had blessed us with something special, and I never wanted it to end, and I wanted to hold on to that moment forever. But like Peter, this was a short trip. I knew I had to be on the road again the next day to meet a helicopter, to fly back to a platform somewhere in the Gulf. But that moment, Friends, that moment, that carried me through the summer and that girl that I met and got to know, I've been married to for 26 years. You know, that moment, it changed my perspective on life. It's become a part of me and, and who I am. And I believe that's how God works. That's how God works. He allows us to experience life and transforms moments into something bigger than that. And I believe that, it, it's these moments that prepare our hearts to, to meet the challenges that we experience in life. Confused, tired from the night's events, the two disciples, or the three disciples from Jesus, they, they, they came down the mountain, right? 
But before they could even reflect on that experience that they had, they found themselves in the middle of an uproar over a failed attempt by the other disciples to heal a child suffering from seizures. And faced with the crowd now, they may have wished, friends, that they could have stayed back on the mountain. See, one of the difficulties in life is that we can't stay there. We can't stay in those moments. We can remember them, but we can't stay there. Like Peter, we want to preserve those experiences forever, but God doesn't call us, friends, to stay there. Because there's always suffering. There's always anger. There's always confusion. There's always hurt that awaits the attention and ministry of those that have been on the mountaintop. It's essential to us, friends, to, to, to have those experiences, to go there, to experience God in just such a profound way. It's important for us to do that, friends, but we cannot stay there. We can't stay there. We can't stay there because it's selfish to do so. Because that experience is not just for us. The light of Jesus is not only for us, but it's to be reflected right through us to the hurting world. Sometimes we'll find ourselves in controversy in the midst of crisis. We'll face that angry crowd. But once we have seen the glory of the Lord, we carry that with us in our hearts, friends, and that shows through us. It shows on our faces as confident children of God. We, we can face this world. With God's help, friends, we can change this world as well. Friends, I'm reminded of another reference to a mountaintop experience by a preacher then Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He prophetically illustrated what it means to have gone to the mountaintop, right? And to return to do God's work. His last public speech in Memphis, he said these profound words. Well, I don't know what's going to happen now. But we've got some difficult days ahead. Friends, that's prophetic. But it doesn't matter with me now, he said, because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind like anybody. I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy. I'm happy tonight, he said. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Wow. Friends, only a few short hours later, he was killed. He knew what it meant to go up the mountain. He knew the difficulties of carrying that message to the lowest valleys of the world. And friends, God calls us to the mountaintop to show us the world from a different perspective, to show us where the hurts are, to show us where we've come from, but also to show us where we must go. He calls us to the mountaintop to see what is before us, but he also calls us there so that we can remember where we've been. And he calls us there not to stay there, but he calls us to go down into the valleys. Friends, when we go to the mountaintop, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us in the name of our Lord Jesus, we will never be the same. We will never be the same. 
Because Jesus calls us to move constantly back and forth. Back and forth from the top of the mountain to the valley of human need. And friends, if you look at your own life, you'll see that pattern. You'll recall those wonderful moments that you've experienced. But also with those wonderful experiences, you've had some pretty bad ones too. But friends, we can go to the mountain to be refreshed, to be reminded, and to get a vision for what we're to do. And there's much to do in this world. Much, much to do in this world because, friends, there is suffering in the world. There are those who are hurting in this world. And in fact, this is a broken world. And until Christ comes again, friends, we are to be his hands and his feet in this world. And so, friends, I want you to reflect on that, to think about those mountaintop experiences in your life. What was it like for you? How would it be to approach those difficult times that are ahead knowing that you've been blessed by God? Let's pray about that this morning. Let's pray. God, we come before you today, Lord. We hear of those mountaintop experiences and for most of us, Lord, we can remember those times. Those times that remind us of what it was like to smile as a child. Those moments of looking into the eyes of a loved one. Those times in which we heard the first cry of an infant. Those times that we said, I do and I love you. Those times that we just saw the smile on the face of a child. Lord God, remind us today that those are your gifts. to enliven us, to help us to go down to the valley to do your work. We pray today, Lord, that you would strengthen us and send your spirit in Christ's holy name. Amen.